what is it about the sciences that you want to know about in terms of being a part of this exciting future? Well, you should be aware that of all the growing occupations in Australia, 75% of them require STEM, that's science, technology, engineering, and maths. Surprisingly, at least to me, the top five highest paid jobs in Adelaide are in STEM industries. STEM graduates are paid well, even straight out of their degree, earning up to, in some cases, 30% more than any other field. And if you're interested in the agricultural area, when you leave, there's up to five jobs for each graduate out there. All in all, there's lots of growth projected for people with STEM knowledge. How do you get that knowledge? When you ask employees what they want, there on the screen are the top five, the, the top five skills that are sought. Now, the, take note, these are not being trained on a specific, for a specific skill. These are what we call transferable skills. Active learning, being able to think critically and assess, being a problem solver, knowing what a problem is and turning your hand to finding a solution. And finally, interpersonal skills. All of these are what you get out of a Bachelor of Science degree. Moreover, the top three certainly are the essence of the scientific method. So built in, in understanding the scientific method, you develop these skills intrinsically. Now these skills are what employers want, but it's difficult for employers to teach them, so they look to the universities to be providing these so-called transferable skills. And then of course, why study science at the University of Adelaide? There are several reasons, as shown on the infographic behind me. It's been rated to give five-star student support in sciences. It's number one in South Australia for science in the graduate satisfaction surveys that are taken every year. At the heart of the university lies the academics, who do research as well as teaching. Their research in all our fields in STEM, in STEM subjects are rated at or above world level in a recent assessment done by the Australian government. The University of Adelaide is ranked typically in the 100 to 150th in the world. It's the top 1% of universities in the world. And that certainly puts it number one in South Australia. The University of Adelaide is part of the prestigious group of eight universities. These are universities that include Sydney, Melbourne, Queensland. Adelaide is part of that. And along with those other GO8 universities, Adelaide is proud of its contributions to research and teaching. Well, that's enough from me. Why don't you hear it from the horse's mouth? So I'd like to first up introduce our graduate, uh, Dr. Ben Owen. He completed a physics degree, a high performance computing degree in 2011, and went on to complete his PhD uh, studying Large Hadron Colliders uh, in 2015. And since then, he's been working at the Bureau of Meteorology, one of the most trusted institutions in Australia, and one that all of us have been turning our eye towards with the recent terror that's been wiping across Australia over the last few months. Sorry, Ben, on that sombre note, see if you can perk up the, uh, the environment. Ben, over to you. No worries. Well, first, I just want to say thank you to uh, the University of Adelaide for having me back to speak with you all tonight. So, um, yeah, my name is Ben. Um, I am a graduate of the University of Adelaide. Um, I, uh, looking back, basically started in 2007 was when I began my degree, and, uh, and I was here for just under a decade. So um, I uh, enjoyed it a lot, um, enough to stick around for so long. Um, so I began my, uh, my, my time at the University of Adelaide, uh, as uh, Greg said, uh, doing a Bachelor of Science in High Performance Computational Physics. 
Physics. Um, and uh, this was a, a four-year degree, so the first three years were the un undergraduate, uh, followed by an honours year. Um, and, uh, and I guess the, this degree was, as it sort of said, the name suggests, was a, a degree that sort of specialises in, I guess, training you in, in physics uh, and with uh, and mathematics, um, along with the computer science to really give you those skills to sort of, I guess, tackle really complex problems, uh, both within the physics, uh, well, essentially in the physics domain. But um, the reality is, it's, it's not just physics that you, you know you can consider. It's problems uh, in all of the sciences, really. And, and I guess looking past, uh, well, having moved on from my degree in my time at the university, I've come to realise that it's not just sciences, it's essentially all walks of life. So I think uh, this degree was really powerful because um, it, uh, it really equipped me with um, the skills I need to, to really tackle really complex problems um, and, and think critically. So, uh, um, but uh, yeah, it was a, a fairly rigid degree um, in terms of what I could do. Um, and for me, this sort of suited me really well because it was sort of I had a really keen interest going into to university uh, for science, uh, particularly in, in physics and mathematics, and uh, and this degree really sort of sated that interest. So um, I was sort of exposed to a, a wide array of uh, of uh, courses in in both physics and mathematics, but also a bit of computer science to sort of, I suppose, uh, broaden my horizons. Um, and, uh, and I found it a really rewarding degree, um, and, uh, and so much so that, yeah, I went on to do my honours, which was, I guess, uh, uh, the final year of the degree, which was really, I guess, focusing on more advanced topics in, in again, physics and maths, as well as doing a, a, an honours project, which was a year-long project. Um, and I guess at the end of that, I sort of, uh, well, it certainly was probably the toughest year of my studies, uh, but probably one of the most rewarding as well. So um, it was, uh, I guess, uh, coming out of that, it really sort of brought all the, uh, my time in undergraduate together um, in the sense that I could sort of look back and, and sort of uh, look at the, the project that I'd done, um, really sort of reinforce those sort of, I guess, those skills that uh, employees are looking for. So it's all about that critical thinking, it's about that problem solving, and I guess it's also about working in a team um, to, to sort of try and tackle uh, a problem. Um, and it's not just sort of a, a problem that's, um, you know, just a... Uh, I guess it's it's, a, it's cutting edge research. So you, you, you're working on problems that are, are not just for the sake of it. It's actually doing things that are meaningful. So um, so that was my undergraduate. Uh, I then went on to sort of stay at the University of Adelaide to do my PhD. Um, so my PhD was actually in um, in particle and nuclear physics, um, and it was uh, studying the structure of protons and neutrons, um, not from a uh, an experimental perspective, but more of a theoretical perspective. So it was essentially uh, coming up with computational and numerical approaches to solving complex problems essentially this complex problem being the structure of protons and neutrons. So, um, and I think, to be honest, I, I think uh, my PhD was probably the time that I enjoyed most at the University of Adelaide. Um, I think it was uh, during that that I really, I think, uh, in terms of the science and, and the work I was working on, it was really interesting um, and I really enjoyed what I was doing. But I think I also began to sort of integrate myself more with the, the university community. So I think uh, sort of getting to, to see what else was going on from, from both broader, uh, the broader science community in the University of Adelaide, but also, I guess, broader across the, the whole university. Um, and, uh, and so I think it was really, yeah, during my PhD that I, I really enjoyed my time here. Um, so essentially, yeah, my PhD took four and a half years. Um, at the end of that, came to realise that academia wasn't for me and so I started to look further afield to sort of see what kind of jobs would interest me. Um, I think during my time, uh, during my PhD, I did a bit of teaching and that was something that really sort of appealed to me. Uh, but I also saw an opportunity to join the Bureau of Meteorology as a, a graduate trainee. Um, and this also looked like quite an interesting opportunity. So I applied um, uh, towards the end of my PhD and, and wasn't actually successful in getting in. So that sort of pushed me to do another degree, uh, which was a graduate diploma of meteorology, um, uh, which took a year. Um, and during that year, essentially, yeah, it was doing... Uh, as you expect, is sort of learning to become a teacher, but I think it was also sort of uh, developing a whole bunch of skills that, again, during my science degree, undergraduate and postgraduate uh, degree, uh, sort of reinforcing some of those things like communication and uh, sort of sort of subject matter expert and really, you know, trying to uh, teach others about what you do and, and why it's important. So, um, so that again, in its own right, was really a, a useful thing to do. Um, and then towards the end of that, I just figured I'd give the Bureau of Meteorology another go and happen to be successful the second time around. So. So, um, yeah, that was my time at the University of Adelaide. Um, I think what drew me to, well, just thinking about my time here, w why did I come here? I think coming in 
and sort of sitting where you are now, I was really drawn to the University of Adelaide, probably from more of an academic perspective. Um, for me, it, well, it still is, uh, I guess, the best university in South Australia for sciences, particularly for physics and mathematics. Um, it's got such a strong program, and I don't think any of the other universities in SA compare. So that was what drew me towards uh, coming here. But I think looking back, um, I think there was a lot of things that um, I, uh, I sort of took for granted, and it wasn't really until sort of finishing up at the University of Adelaide that it really sort of uh, dawned on me that uh, there's many more reasons to come here other than just, you know, the academic side. So, I mean, it, the facilities here are, are outstanding. Um, so we've had amazing campuses both, you know, up here at North Terrace, but there's also the White Campus in Roseworthy, and, and these are world-class uh, uh, campuses. Um, there's the world-class research that's done here. So as uh, Greg mentioned, is that all of the research that's undertaken in the, uh, the Faculty of Sciences is, is sort of cutting edge and, and world-leading. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's sort of working alongside and with uh, these academics who are uh, sort of working on cutting edge problems is, is really uh, uh, an attractive reason to be here. Um, and I think with that sort of comes the high quality teaching. So I guess if you're a world-class institution in terms of your research, uh, the other side of that is the, the sub subject matter experts are sort of leading uh, in, in their fields. And so the, the teaching is outstanding. Um, and, uh, and also the exceptional staff. And that's not just the teaching staff, but also the administrative staff. Um, I think it's sort of towards the end of your well, the undergraduate and into my PhD that I really sort of began to appreciate these people. Um, but they are, are sort of... Uh, 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 instrumental in, in everyone's success. Uh, so um, I think uh, that's uh, something worth pointing out. And then the last thing was the vibrant student life and, and campus culture. So I think during my undergraduate, it's probably something I didn't take uh, as much time to sort of uh, enjoy. But uh, during my postgraduate time, I certainly I did. Um, and, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's part of the experience. So I yeah, really encourage people to not just sort of look down and, and study the books. It's uh, get out there and enjoy what's going on. So I guess... Um, a bit about what I do now. So uh, uh, I'm yeah, basically a, a meteorologist with the Bureau of Meteorology. Um, and uh, I've been there since uh, 2016. Um, so the first year was really to just sort of train myself in, in essentially meteorology, so the weather science. Um, and uh, I guess all of the study that I'd done academically prepared me for, for the, the subject matter. But it also, I think uh, post that, it's, um, it also prepared me for doing the job really effectively. So um, I guess the primary responsibility uh, currently uh, is a weather forecaster. So um, my job is to produce and communicate weather forecasts. Uh, the process we sort of go through doing that is, is analyzing huge amounts of, of observational and, and numerical weather prediction data. So it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of data analysis. Um, and then from that is essentially synthesizing this into to understanding how the atmosphere is sort of the state it's in now and how it's going to evolve into the future. So it's sort of that problem solving and, and, and analytic skills there. Um, and through that, with that picture, we then sort of produce weather forecasts. Uh, so, um, and weather forecasts for a variety of, of users. So there's the, the public weather forecasts that you sort of get on the internet and through the, the uh, media outlets. But it's also uh, aviation. So the aviation industry is a huge uh, uh, subscriber to our forecasts, as well as, uh, I guess, the key one at the moment is the emergency services. So um, as a weather forecaster, we're basically writing forecast for, for firefighters out there on the field to really try and you know understand what the weather's going to do and, and sort of help them to really make a difference in, in fighting those fires. So uh, so I guess um, how did my degree prepare me for, for this job? Um, so I guess I sort of mentioned, yeah, academically, um, joining the Bureau, bureau I was uh, well and truly equipped to sort of essentially do all the coursework and, and really excel at doing that. But I think uh, more importantly is um, uh, it's, it's sort of those soft soft skills that are probably the most important thing in terms of what I do in my day-to-day -day job. So um, and I guess thinking about it, uh, the things that sort of come to mind are effective communication of te technical matter. So I guess a, a, a forecast is only as good, well, you can have the best forecast in the world, but if you can't communicate that, it's basically useless. So I think it's really important having those sort of skills to communicate what you, essentially all this technical information to the user. And, and so, I mean, through that science degree, you know, presenting your scientific findings is, is a crucial element. So that was one of the things that I found, uh, well, one of those skills that throughout both my undergraduate, postgraduate, and then into my uh, grad dip ed, you know, that was something that sort of came out. Um, working seamlessly within a team and independently. So these are skills that I think just throughout any degree you sort of develop but certainly in the sciences as well. I mean, sciences has evolved 
uh, to be a very much a, a team-based problem-solving sort of environment. So it's not just about doing your own thing, it's about working with others to really try and crack crack problems and, and, and come out with solutions. So that's again something that, that came out of my degree. Um, working to strict deadlines. So as a forecaster, we basically only have a set amount of time to you know, do this analysis, come out, and then provide a forecast. And, and so, so that's a, a really important thing. Um, and then the, the next one, having the confidence to make timely judgments. Um, it's really important that in my job that I basically have to make some you know, calls sometimes. And it's essentially, I think as a scientist, you're sort of trying to think critically, but you're also sort of encouraged and, and uh, to, to take a lead and, and sort of make a judgment. So that's something, again, through my degree. It's sort of these skills that sort of come out time and time again in what I do. Um, learn from my failures and then just sort of display flexible thinking. Again, some of the things that I find really useful. And I think it's not until sort of, I guess, post, especially postgraduate, but also into, into actually doing my job that I came to realise that, you know, it wasn't just, I didn't come out of my degree with, uh, with the scientific knowledge. I came out of my degree with all these really important skills. And these are really important skills that have allowed me to succeed in what I do now. So... Um, I guess um, I guess finishing up, um, where do I see myself going into the future with what I've done so far and, and where I'm at now? Um, I think uh, forecasting, like a lot of things, is going to change into the future, and that's because of technology. So um, what we do now, effectively, technology, as our weather models get better and, uh, and we get more and more information, it's harder for a forecast to essentially analyse all of that and actually make a difference, So uh, at least in the traditional way of doing things. So as technology changes, we need to change the way we're doing things. And, and currently, the Bureau is actually going through a bit of a transformation in, in in terms of the way we do things because of this. Um, I th I'd like to think, I mean, going through this process, there's a lot of complicated problems that we need to sort of try and solve and, and new ways of doing things. And I think it's really, I mean, like thinking about all the experiences that I've had in my time at university, um, I feel like I, I'm really well equipped to sort of tackle some of these problems. So going forward, essentially, it, there's a lot of change in how we do things, and it's going from a, a more of a production-based role to being more of a communication-based role and, and really being sort of a liaison, uh, trying to provide weather information um, rather than provide weather forecasts. Um, I know there's, they sound very similar, but there is a subtle difference there. And I think it's that expertise that sort of is the, the way that we're moving forwards. And, and I'd like to think that everything that I've done up until now, particularly my time at university, sort of equipped me to really succeed in this future role. So um, yeah, that's a bit about me. And I guess I'll pass the mic on. Thank you. Hey. Um, is that okay? Good afternoon everyone, my name is Amy Norman and I am 18 years old. I graduated from Golden Grove High School in 2018 and completed my first year of uni study in 2019. During my brief talk this evening, I'll be discussing my studying experience throughout uni and my goals for the future. In my final few years of high school education, I began attending the informative open days at Flinders Adelaide and, um, SA Uni. Since a young age, I'd always known my interest was animals. Therefore, when I attended these events, I would attend specific talks regarding animal-related subjects. By doing this and some additional online research, I chose to study a Bachelor of Science in Animal Behaviour at Adelaide University. As part of this degree, students are required to attend classes at Adelaide Uni's Roseworthy campus. This campus is certainly one of a kind. Not only does it provide a peaceful and resourceful place to study, a range of animals are located directly on campus, allowing for an amazing hands-on experience. Additionally, Roseworthy campus has multiple student-run animal-related clubs. These clubs are extremely educational and are a great opportunity, especially if you wish to specialise in a specific species. A few highlights during my first year of study in this degree include volunteering at the Royal Adelaide Show with Roseworthy's Pig Club, presentations by experts in the field of animal behaviour, and several opportunities to increase my knowledge whilst gaining connections in the working community. A tremendous feature of all campuses of Adelaide University is the support services. In my experience, I have utilised peer mentoring and the faculty office. These two services assisted me in a plethora of issues regarding exams, enrolment and general subject content. However, these are only two support services out of the many that Adelaide Uni provide. Other support services include the Academic Drop-In Centre and, of course, the lecturers. My life as a university student has been both eventful and rewarding. I enjoy being a student as it constantly encourages me to better myself. However, I look forward to graduating as I am eager to start in the workforce. Once I graduate, I hope to become more involved in the volunteering community 
whilst working towards my ultimate career goal of becoming a zoologist. And thank you for listening. <laughs> Hey everyone, um, I'm Lucy. I've just completed my undergraduate degree in wildlife conservation biology. Um, I'm from country South Australia, so I moved here straight from year 12 um, into Adelaide to start my degree. And I chose this degree, unlike many people, just a couple of days before the SATAC deadline. I decided very last minute to make a dramatic change from physiotherapy to wildlife conservation. Um, and now, three years ahead, I know that this is probably the best decision that I've ever made in my life. Coming to Adelaide Uni has been the best thing for me, and this degree I really could not recommend anymore. It has been an incredibly well-run, hands-on, interesting, engaging and enjoyable course with so many opportunities to get outside, build relationships and be involved in local conservation activities. Adelaide Uni itself has an amazing reputation, as you've heard already. And so many extracurricular opportunities and support services that made this uni the most appealing to me. Over the past three years, I've made lifelong friends with so many people, including my lecturers and demonstrating staff. And I fostered a very strong passion for the environment. But, as I said, I was not always so sure of this decision. But in my process of deciding this degree, I attended talks just like this. I went to open days and it was a talk just like this, but quite a lot smaller, that inspired me to do my degree. So now, just finished, I've got an amazing group of friends that support me. Throughout my degree, the best parts of it were probably the overseas study tour that I had the opportunity to do. So I went to Cambodia with a few of my lecturers and um, some fellow students and looked at the wildlife trade over there. And it was the most, it was probably the pinnacle of my degree. It really shifted things. Um, and I met so many people through it and it really just was the highlight. But there's also lots of, um, of work experience opportunities as well. So I've been on lots of field trips, a lot of camps. And I feel like this really distinguished itself, um, Adelaide Uni, from other unis because I've just finished my degree knowing exactly what I'm going to do in the workplace. So I've been out in the field and I've done environmental surveys and I've met professionals. And so I feel very confident at the end of just a three-year degree in going into wildlife conservation and being able to implement all the things that I've learned. Throughout my time at uni, I think I utilise quite a lot of things. Um, obviously I moved from the country to the city which is super daunting. I was lucky to move into one of the Adelaide Uni supported residential colleges which made this transition quite a lot easier. But I also over time built that really great support network of friends and lecturers um, who I'm sure I'll still be leaning on for years to come. And many of these friendships were fostered through the extracurricular activities and clubs and I was supported academically, especially through past sessions, which are um, peer-assisted students, uh, peer-assisted study sessions. So that's where there's um, older students that run just like small tutorials with um, younger students about their courses, and also academic drop-in centres. They're really great. Any time of the week, you can drop in um, and get help on your assignments. But probably the most out of every resource that the Adelaide Uni offers were my lecturers and my demonstrators. Um, in my degree of study, I found that all of the lecturers and demonstrators were very, very approachable. I could always come to them with questions, and not just questions on my courses either. I would come to them with questions about my degree or just about general um, volunteer opportunities, and they were just always really happy to help, which was great. The next step for me in this journey um, I'm going to be staying at Adelaide Uni because I can't get enough of it. And in just under a month, I will begin my research on the impacts of microplastic pollution in the Spencer Gulf. Um, this is my honours year and I'm super excited to do it. And I'm still unsure on what I'm going to be doing after that. But unlike many graduates, I'm really confident that there's going to be lots of opportunities after my honours degree purely because of the amazing network of people at the Adelaide Uni and I know that I can probably go 
to one of my lecturers and find myself work experience or opportunities in NGOs and departments all through the conservation and ecology area. So I hope that was helpful. <laughs> Um, hey, my name is Ms. Khan. I just graduated from my um, undergrad in Bachelor of Science in Space Science and Astrophysics. I'm about to start my Master's in Feb. Um, not 100% sure what my research project will be, but it will be in either modeling or something experimental. Um, I wasn't too sure exactly what I had to do in this talk, so I thought the best thing I could do is give some bit, a bit of advice to um, people starting this year. Um, what I would like to say is to get into my master's, I, my GPA was just under the cutoff to get into my master's and I thought that was the end of it and I'd have to do my honours, which again, not the end of the world, but I desperately wanted to get into my master's. And I found that talking to my lecturers, talking to any staff, Everyone working here at the university wants you to, su to succeed, every single one of them. If um, they will come up with a hundred ways to get you to what you want, where you want to go and make sure you participate to the fullest in the university because that is the best way to, su to succeed. You can do well in all of your courses, but if you're ever in any situation where you need the slightest amount of help, there's like a hundred people at this university here to help you. and because I found a way, there's a GP clinic here at university. I got a doctor's note for my health issues. I found a way to get my lecturer to write a letter of recommendation and found a way to get into my master's despite the fact that my GPA was just under what it had to be. And um, I would say, again, transitioning from high school to university, it's very important to remember that it's not as, um, it's a lot, the structure is very free at university. You have to be very self-motivated, self-driven to succeed at university, but you have to be the one to put yourself out there at university compared to in high school where your teachers do look after you. A lecturer will not know you until you introduce yourself to them. A tutor will not know you until you introduce yourself to them. The best thing I can say is just to put yourself out there, participate, join clubs, go to all of the um, resources provided to you, go to the academic drop-in centers. There's so much available at this university. Just make sure you try a little bit of everything while you can and you will get the most out of it. Hi guys, my name's Ella. Um, I'm currently, or just about to start, my third year in the Bachelor of Science Advanced Degree, studying microbiology, immunology and chemistry. Biochemistry, not chemistry, I'll get into that later. Um, when I first started, or at least what attracted me to the university was the fact that since I was probably this tall, I knew that I wanted to be an immunologist. I knew I wanted to be helping people um, where potentially they couldn't help themselves. And um, throughout my, I knew knowing that, in hindsight, hindsight's a great thing. But um, throughout my year, year 10 um, and year 11, uh, work experience opportunities, I went and did, um, I actually did work experience with or work observation um, with the Wake Campus um, to do with their, um, their viticulture and winemaking. Um, that was three days of observation and that just cemented Adelaide for me. Um, but I also did, um, had experience working in an accounting firm and found that an office job no, thank you. Um, so I think that throughout work experience, and then I'll sort of tack into this a little bit later, I found that more so what I didn't want to do. Um, but coming to Adelaide actually has helped me cement what I do want to do. Um, so I didn't know whether I, what I wanted to come into, whether I wanted to go into medicine, whether I wanted to do health and medical sciences, whether I wanted to come in and do a science whether I wanted to go, in, go into being, being a practicing doctor, whether I wanted to be a reason, it's, it's just so many things that I was trying to consider all at once. Um, but I came to a talk just like you guys um, a couple of years ago and a few of the ac people where we were sitting right now um, just inspired me um, and I saw myself in them, um, which was just amazing. Um, and after coming out of this talk, I walked out and went, yeah, this is the place, this is for me. Um, so my journey after coming out of high school I mean, my high school was very, very small. Uh, for some of you who have travelled a long way, I feel like you might be able to relate to this a little bit. Um, but my high school, my graduating class in year 12 was a class of 13. 
Um, so coming to university, and especially in O-Week, walking into a campus that has so many students was very, very daunting for me um, and was a very scary experience in the first couple of weeks. Um, but I found that, again, all of the support services that the guys have already touched on, um, there's not really much that I can say that they haven't said, but um, I found that um, just putting yourself out there and having the confidence, it takes a little while to get a hold of, but having the confidence to be able to put yourself out there and say, hey, my name's Ella, this is what I'm interested in, what are you interested in? Like, you have to make conversation with people, um, as, as scary as it is. Um, so that was that. And then coming into university, um, the first couple of weeks I found very, very difficult. Um, so the support services that I used was the counselling service. Um, and it's a completely free, you can just walk in, make an appointment and say, hey, help me, or at least just someone, can, can you listen to what I have to say? Um, and to be able to be talk, uh, talk to someone without judgement um, was something that was absolutely like a game changer for me. Um, so I think, so that was that as well. Getting into the academic side, I used all of the drop-in centres. Um, I went to a few PASS sessions as well. Um, I wish I stayed with PASS, um, I, so I would highly recommend going to a PASS session if you can um, and sticking with it. Um, everything else fell under, um, I've sort of, once I got my footing, um, I was able to make my own decisions, make my own choices and be comfortable and confident with those. Um, so coming and so working my way through my degree, I, started, I actually started off um, planning to do a chemistry major, um, but I found I, first, in, um, first year chemistry was amazing. I absolutely loved it. I love Greg's lectures <laughs> um, in first semester. Um, and I have fond memories of all of the practicals that were done. Um, but I got into second semester, uh, second year, first semester, and found that it wasn't for me. Um, I felt I had hit a roadblock um, and I couldn't find a way to get over it. Um, and not to scare any of you, um, but more to say that it, like, it happens. Um, I actually almost failed my chemistry subject um, and that scared me a lot. I'm a big perfectionist. So to have that grade come back absolutely scared me um, and I didn't know how to recover from that. So again, I went to the Science Services Hub, which would have been pointed out to you, hopefully, um, on your tours. I walked in there and said, hey, this is, what, this is what's happened. I don't know how to deal with this. Can you please help me? Um, and I live in there and have lived in there every, pretty much every semester since, um, making sure that I'm at where I want to be and I'm giving myself the opportunities that I want to give myself. Um, that, and because even though like coming into degrees, you guys will be looking online and trying to decide what you're trying to do, but there's just so much information out there that you don't see it all all at once. Um, so going in to talk to them actually showed me the breadth um, of uh, opportunities that I could give myself. So coming into that, I've then decided to choose um, a biochemistry major um, instead of a chemistry major and still keeping um, my microbiology interest as well. Um, and have actually found myself at the moment, I'm in the middle, I've got three weeks left um, of a summer research scholarship. So because research is something that I feel like I want to go into, I know it's not for everyone, but it's something, lab work is just something, there's something in it that just keeps me excited. Um, but I've been able to work in um, one of the labs just behind us um, in the Molecular Life Sciences building um, with a malaria researcher there. So I've been actually able to utilise all of the skills that I've had in my degree um, and more that I didn't even know I had um, and cement those in effort to help, even though it's a six week placement, so it's only a very, very short amount of time, but that shows me and it has shown me and has cemented for me um, the decision that I'd made when I was this tall, um, that I wanted to go out and help people. Um, and, and fortunately for me, um, I started seeing patterns and I was able to make that decision um, based on the whole experience. Um, so I'm helping actually doing a little bit like research on proteins of the, um, the malaria parasite itself, which is really, really, really cool. I could go on about it for days, but I won't bore you with it all. <laughs> um, but the main bit of advice that I could give you um, as students coming in is to make sure that you always say yes. Never sort of put yourself back. I know it, it's very easy to say no because it's a, new, it's a new environment, it's a new situation, but give yourself the opportunity to explore. Go and join clubs and societies. Even if you're not sure whether it's gonna interest you, just go and do it. Um, you meet new people, you meet new people every day. Um, and that's something that I love about uni is that I feel like I've met everyone within my degree, but then someone else decides to turn up as well. So, absolutely love it. Um, but the main thing is would be to always say yes. Um, I think that's all that I have to say.
Well, but, um, thank you all for your personal testaments, and I can assure you that none of them were paid much. <clears throat> we're moving to the point where we're going to be able to for, for you to ask us questions, but before we do, so we've heard sort of about the big picture. What I want to do is go through, start about the process, some of the, the nitty gritty. So much of this you, you already know, but I just want to make sure that we're all speaking the same language. So up here we have a list of the degrees on offer in the Faculty of Sciences. Now, the, the most general degree is the one in the bottom right hand corner that says Bachelor of Science. Um, so that, that's a degree that you can do any core, what you know as subjects in year 11, year 12, we call courses here at university. You can do any, any courses with that as long as you have the, the prerequisites if necessary. But if, so if you're not sure what you want to get into, what area of specialization, like I've just heard some of these, these um, personal accounts where some of them knew what they wanted to get into and some of them found their feet in, in first year typically. That's we find what generally happens. But if you think you know exactly what you want to get into, then there are what we call these named degrees and they're all the other degrees that are up there. So they're already built up with a particular focus in mind. You can see that they're based under these subject areas, agriculture, food, wine, vet sciences, biomed sciences, etc. Now, as well as the Bachelor of Science, you're aware that there's the Bachelor of Science Advanced, which again is similar, is very, very general, but it has a higher ATAR. And the, what that allows is what you, it allows you to do one subject each year that specifically has a research type focus. And although none of the, the students spoke about that, I'm sure that the advanced students, and Ellie, you said you were an advanced student, I'm sure you would say that those subjects, PPR2, PPR3, are wonderful, wonderful experiences for everyone. Every, everybody loves them. Now, in addition, you see that there are some new uh, degrees on offer for 2020. Um, so Bachelor of Applied Data Analytics. There's also a direct entry into a Bachelor of Science Honours. So that's a four-year degree, and we've already heard mention about honours. So that allows you to directly be guaranteed a place in honours. There's also Bachelor of Science Advanced Honours version as well, and also Bachelor of, of, of Veterinary Technology. So these are the new degrees. So they're all science degrees. It's just that some of them are built with a particular focus straight away, and you're sort of guided into your, your course choice. But if you're unsure, a Bachelor of Science or a Bachelor of Science Advanced is an excellent way um, to study sciences at the University of Adelaide. And to help you with with that, that's what we're going to be offering you the opportunity later on for these one-on-one -on -one sessions, either tonight or, or later on. So once you're enrolled in one of these particular degrees, and sorry, what I forgot to say is when you finally graduate and you go up on the stage of Benython Hall in your gown and everyone's wearing their finest, a few people wear shorts these days, I've, I've been noticing, um, and shake the Vice Chancellor's hand, he will give you a parchment, a testimure, and that degree that you've just seen on the previous slide, that will be printed on, um, on your testimure. In addition, what is printed on your testimure is your area of specialization. This is what we call a major. So this is what you see on the screen now. And you can see that it spans all the different sciences. There are some things called a single major, which means you have one um, area of specialization. Often you'll have two. So you might have, say, biochemistry with um, chemistry, that's a popular one, or biochemistry and microbiology and immunology, that's another popular combination. Or what we call double majors, so some of the disciplines like chemistry, for example, you can just do all of your focus, particularly at your third year, on one particular uh, sub-discipline of sciences. So this is what we mean by now the major. And for all of these degrees, with I think one exception, I can't remember off the top of my head, you must get a major at the end in order for you to, to, to get your degree. But you don't need to worry about this in first year. In first year, you're encouraged to be as broad as you can and see what you like, and then you start to focus as you progress to second year and to third year. OK, so this is where we all are at the moment. You've all, may or may, well, I think you've all had an offer, all the prospective students, at least the data that I've seen. So be aware that you only receive one offer per round and you'll get that for the highest preference you qualify for. And there are six possible responses that you can make. And three, 
Three of them are similar in that you're saying that you wish to be considered for higher preferences. And for many of you, I'm aware that that's what you're considering tonight, that you need to be wondering if you should accept that offer or can you apply for something else. So what you can do is change the order of your preferences. Um, so that's something that you can do. And you, you can always leave your options open. So you can accept your current offer, but you could accept but wish to be considered for higher preferences and then see how you go in the subsequent rounds. So your first offer, just repeat, doesn't need to be your final one. You can rearrange your, your preferences. Um, and if you want to wait for another offer, your preferred degree must be a higher preference than the one you received. So you need to adjust your preferences so that it, it's at a higher offer. And if just, again, to reiterate, if you haven't selected wish to be considered for higher preferences, you will not receive another offer. Now, if you wait for another offer, it won't negatively impact on your potential to enrol in that first offer offering. Um, you can still get uh, this, this additional offer, so there's plenty of time. And you see at the bottom of the screen there, you see all the rounds that are opening, that are open. So there's one coming up in a few days' time. That's why today is strategically placed to be a few days before that, that next round. If you want to make changes, I've been told, and you can confirm this with, with uh, some of the advisors, is that you need to change your preferences by midnight of the 8th. Have I got that? But there's a few nods over there, so I've obviously got that, remember that correctly. But you see that um, 10th of Jan, 23rd of Jan, and then every week from early February until March. There's plenty of opportunity for doing this, and we know that students, prospective students, often do change their minds many, many times, and that's, that's fine. And finally, i just also say that with the Bachelor of Science, your ATAR isn't the only way of getting in. With the Bachelor of Science, there is consideration made of the subjects that you made, so what's called subject-based admission, um, where it considers your, your scores in specifically the sciences. And information about that is not up there. How will we get information? Go and see one of the advisors uh, later on. Okay, now, much of this has been focused on the prospective students, but just about half of you here are the parents and guardians. And we know that you've had a tough time too. Those cranky students wanting to study all the time, you've been feeding them, clothing them, giving them as much opportunity uh, to study as possible and encouraging them along the way. But you have questions too, and tonight is an opportunity for you to ask questions as well. You are also welcome into the Science Services Hub. So there's a picture of it there. It's sort of behind you, physically located on campus behind you and up a, a, a flight of stairs uh, up uh, the middle of the campus. Or you can talk to some people tonight. There's a hotline there. Call that if you have any short specific questions. Or you can also book appointments on the website that you see there. Now, as well as hearing from students, or past students and, and present students, we also have a, another team of academics from the other three schools of um, the Faculty of Sciences, and also some of the administrative staff who work in the faculty office, and I'm going to hand over to them for them to introduce themselves and talk a bit about what their areas of, of specialisation are. And um, for all of these people, including the students, you'll have an opportunity of, of talking with these people later on. So over to you, Beth. Thanks, Greg. Wow, it's so good to see you all here. Um, I feel like it's a really hard gig to follow these guys, though. They are amazing and expressed themselves so amazingly. And I thought, wow, I work at a really cool place. Um, so. As the slide says, my name is uh, Beth Lovies. I work out at the Wake Campus. Um, I am a plant physiologist by training, um, but t converted my position here at the University of Adelaide to an education specialist in 2015. Um, so that means that I am a teaching only academic. So my role is really to translate all the amazing research that happens at the university into language which I can then teach to our students. Um, working at the weight is amazing. The first slide that Greg showed about food production, that just says it all really. Um, our students are there to learn about how to grow food, 
how to grow food better, how to grow food smarter. Um, and another one of those fantastic statistics that uh, Greg had up on one of those slides about uh, jobs for our graduates. Our, our graduates, I have not known of a single graduate since I started work in 2011 at uh, the Wake campus who has not had a job before they've finished their degree. And usually they've got three or four that they're picking and choosing from. So that's a pretty amazing um, position for a newly graduated uh, student to, to be in by the end of their degree. So I teach into the Bachelor of Ag and the Bachelor of Viticulture and Enology and also the Bachelor of Food and Nutrition Science. One of the really lovely things about the Wake campus is that it is slightly smaller than North Terrace. So I get to know every single one of my students. Um, mostly I can remember their name, sometimes not quite, but mostly I remember their name. Um, and we have a, have a really close-knit community at, at, the, at the Wake campus. Um, I'll be around um, after you've had a chance to ask these guys some questions. So if anyone's considering um, doing a Bachelor of Ag, Bachelor of Viticulture or Bachelor of Food and Nutrition Science, I would be more than happy to chat to you out the front later on. So thank you. Yeah, my name's uh, Dan Pete, and I'm uh, in the School of Biological Sciences. I'm also a biochemist. You've heard a bit about biochemists. Who thinks they know what a biochemist is? Well, we've got at least one. I'm not even sure what I do. I think we're people who can't decide whether we're biologists or chemists, so we sit somewhere in the middle. Um, as a biochemist, I have a fairly standard academic position. Part of my role is to do research. Does anyone know what the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology was awarded for last year? No one, you're gonna to have to go home and look that up. It was in how cells sense oxygen in the body, particularly low oxygen, and how that relates to human disease. That's my area of research. Sadly, I didn't win a Nobel Prize, but it really is quite a, a topical area of, of research. Um, I have a number of roles in the school. One is the head of learning and teaching. So uh, in charge of learning and teaching for all of our different degrees and programs. And they include uh, the Bachelor of Science in Marine Biology, uh, Bachelor of Science in Wildlife Conservation Biology, and we've heard about that. Bachelor of Science in Biotechnology, and the last one is the Bachelor of Science in Biomedical Science. And I'm actually the Program Coordinator of the Biomedical Science degree as well. So if you've got any questions about that afterwards, please feel free to come and ask me. In our school, we also cover a number of other majors, uh, areas like ecology, which covers things like zoology and botany, uh, spatial science, evolutionary biology, uh, biochemistry, genetics, microbiology and immunology, as we've heard. And our most recent or newest major, uh, a new one this year, is in bioinformatics, really understanding and, and analyzing very large biological data sets. Things like, for example, the human genome sequences where you've got three billion base pairs of information from uh, hundreds or thousands of individuals. So it's working out how to deal with uh, those data. Uh, the other uh, couple of ones, the, the new degree we've just uh, heard a little bit about was the Bachelor of Applied Data Analytics. We have uh, two sort of specialisations there as well in the school, one in bioinformatics again and the second one is in environment. So a range of majors and a range of different degrees. So once again if you have any questions about that please come, come up and ask. Uh, in terms of advice for students about to commence, you've had some great advice once again from uh, the students here. I can't add much to that. I would say uh, a couple of things. One is really try and enjoy yourself in first year. There's a lot of things to experience at university. Make the most of those and enjoy. And the second is breadth. Uh, science is important. You've heard about that tonight, but it's not the only thing. So uh, you do have opportunity to study in other areas and other subjects as well. So particularly in first year, make the most of those. Hello, everyone. My name is Kapil. Uh, I'm uh, from the School of Animal and Vet Sciences, which is based at Roseworthy. Uh, I came to Australia in 2005. Um, 
I did my vet degree from India and then I did my uh, PhD and membership uh, exam in Australia. So I'm a veterinarian by, uh, by, by profession. Um, my first experience after coming to Australia, um, on very first day, uh, in India people ask you, how do you do, how are you doing? And uh, on very first day when I came to Australia, someone said, how are you going? And I said, I'm going by bus. Uh, the reason I'm telling that to you is, is as a teacher at Roseworthy, we not only just uh, teach students, we also try to communicate them in their language, and which is very important as a teacher. Um, at Roseworthy campus, um, you can look at all the information in the booklet, but we teach, uh, we're about to teach the fourth new course, Veterinary Technology. Uh, we teach Bachelor uh, uh, of Animal Science, uh, there is, um, Amy just talked about her experience um, of studying animal behavior. There is a uh, bachelor's in veterinary bioscience, and there is a doctor of veterinary medicine we call DVM. Uh, I, I'm very proud to say that I'm part of a vet school, which is ranked in top 50 in the world. Um, now, a lot of you are year 12 students and parents. Um, there, are, there are students in different categories. I'm... I'm um, I have a huge respect for, for students who are very determined and know what they are going to do in their life. Uh, I was not one of them. I was very confused when I was in year 12. And it is okay to be confused. There is nothing wrong to be confused. Um, but for choosing a science, all, all what I, I'm going to say is if you would like to uh, learn a new technology and help community, help human health, and help animals, there is a bit of a scientist in you. There's a bit of a science in you. And that's where you can make a choice of selecting any science-based degree. If you would like to have more information about what we offer at Roseworthy, so just like as Beth said, uh, at Roseworthy, it's much smaller compared to North Terrace. We are a close-knit community. You will find less number of students just stuck to their mobile phones at Roseworthy. We do talk to each other quite a bit. Uh, we do prefer communicating face-to-face -face rather than through social media, but that doesn't mean to say that we do not use social media. Uh, we do use that as well, but um, we do try to remember, I, I can't remember the name of every single student, but we do have uh, pictures of every single student. So we, uh, one of our strength is a small size class at Roseworthy. Um, and because of the small size class, we are able to work individually uh, with students. Uh, we have a number of internships. Um, we have a large number of almost all of our students who are able to find a job by the time they finish their degree. So there are a lot of strengths and a lot of um, uh, unique opportunities at Roseworthy campus. If you have specific questions about careers in, in any of the animal-related area, including vet science, admissions, uh, and other questions, uh, I'll be around, so feel free to ask questions. In the best interest of time, I'm going to be very brief and hand over to Liz um, uh, next, but I'm happy to ask uh, answer questions afterwards. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, so my name is Liz, I work in the Future Student Team, so if you ever had any questions leading up to this about entry requirements or pathways into uni or how to apply, you probably spoke to myself or one of my colleagues. Um, if you do have any questions about your preferences or um, you haven't quite got the offer that you want or you want to change things around, even bridging courses, I'm happy to have a chat afterwards um, and I look forward to meeting you all. Hi all, I'm Rory Ciceri. Um This is my colleague Sharon Kildare. Um, we are student advisors and we're located in the Science Services Hub over in the Darling Building on ground floor. Um, basically, we're the first point of contact for any student-related inquiries that you may have, um, whether it's study, study plan advice or enrolment advice, um, exchange inquiries, etc. Um, so our office hours are Monday to Friday from 9 to 5, so don't be afraid to come and see us um, or even just to pop in and say hi. Thank you.
Okay, all of these people are available to answer questions. We have two mics, including quite literally a throw mic. So we've probably got a bit under 10 minutes if, if there are any questions of a sort of a general nature and I can throw to any of, any of the, uh, the panel. Does anyone have a question? Don't be shy. You've heard from the students how welcoming we are. There's one down here. Just wait till we get to the mic to you, please. Um, after an honours year, do many students continue to study or do most enter the, the workforce? I think I know that fairly well. Um, so, so it depends on which discipline area. So in some areas it could be a very high proportion. So I know in physics, for example, a very high proportion of the students, once they finish their bachelor's degree, will go on to honours. It's also possible to go straight into what's called an MPhil no honours route. So that's a two-year degree, and that's considered as a higher degree of research. Um, in other areas where there's a real pull for jobs, and perhaps I'm wondering perhaps how... So, so certainly in the physical sciences, I'd say it would range between about 30% to about 90% of the students would, would go on. Um, I would say in uh, my the degrees that I'm involved in, Bachelor of Ag and Bachelor of Viticulture and Enology, honours is actually quite rare. Um, we certainly have honours students and there is an honours program, but most of our students are fully equipped to go into their chosen field um, after their batch, just their, their standard undergraduate bachelor's degree. Dan, did you want to say something about biological sciences? Yeah. Biological sciences would be somewhere in between. So uh, certainly a, a reasonable portion, maybe 20 or 30% would go on and do uh, honours. Uh, and then some of those would go on to further study as well. Uh, okay, so my, my answer to that question is in two parts. So firstly, for veterinary science, there is no specific honours. So vet science is a six years uh, course. So first segment is three years of vet by science and then three years of Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, which is DVM. Uh, so there is no specific honours, but uh, if someone is, is dedicated to be a scientist, uh, after finishing six years of vet degree, um, our large proportion of graduates, they work in practice after finishing a vet degree. Uh, I did the same. Uh, but for animal behaviour, animal science, um, uh, about 20 to 30% of students prefer to do honours, but that is not an absolute requirement. A lot of our students, uh, particularly animal science students, are able to get or, or secure a job uh, without doing honours as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thanks, everyone. Another question. Sorry for being so brusque, but I want to get through as many questions as possible. You get a chance to speak into that phone box. There we go. You ready to catch it? All right, floor is yours. Yes, Ella mentioned that she found pass sessions invaluable. What are pass sessions? Um, so sorry, I touched, touched on that as my, mine as well. So it's um, peer-assisted study sessions. So it's where you have um, a student that's, so say if, say if I'm doing first year geology, it'll be a second or a third year geology student or even an, an honours student, someone that's already done that course and they come in into a small room and they go through questions with you. So I did it especially for geology in my first year. Before a test, I would go into a past session and we'd run through practice tests and if there was concepts, I think it would be especially good for stuff like maths. If there's a concept that you don't understand, you have someone that's probably a little bit closer in age to you to your lecturers and it's a smaller group than a lecture theatre. So it's just... It's more of that classroom learning to build on concepts and go through stuff to make you more confident. Uh, I'll just add to that that the past leaders, as we call them, so the senior students who are um, running those sessions are really highly trained. Um, they have to have d excelled in that particular course um, and then they have specific training uh, to help the more junior students to understand complex uh, problems. So it, it's sort of it's a fairly rigorous system to get into uh, to be a past leader and be part of the past program. All right. Any other questions? 
No one wants a box thrown at them? Oh, there's one over there. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, about how much of the courses are now online or delivered online and how much will be face-to-face? -face? Okay, so there's... Now, is this true faculty-wide? Certainly in our school there's a requirement that all lectures are recorded, and I think that's true pretty much across the university now. Um, often quizzes now are, are online, so you might be given either a, a few days or a, or a week to do them. So some of the assessment go, is going online. Um, in sciences, is there anyone that doesn't have exams? Any courses that don't? I'm not aware. Certainly in chemistry, we still have exams, although it's it's it depends on how much it, it's worth for the course. But it's certainly not significant anymore. I mean, I guess in the olden days it was 80% of, but it's more like, geez, final exam, sinking my feet. Typically, foot, yeah, 30, 40, 50%. It, it really depends on the course, but. There, there is a move for a lot of online content and the students touched on it. One of the disappointing things for me as an academic is I really think I'm a good lecturer. <laughs> um, and it's very disappointing when I have a class, say in the Bragg's Lecture Theatre, and a fraction of the students would turn up and I would put a lot of effort into designing and trying to make an entertaining course. So what was said before is take, take advantage of, of the lectures. You really do learn a lot and I think that experience, that live experience where you can interact with the lecturer, you do get more out of it than simply just l watching a recorded lecture online. Um, but the students don't seem to be listening to me <laughs> at the moment. Yeah, just a couple of things to add to that. We do have some courses that have no exams, so it's oh, all okay. continuous assessment. But the other major thing I think that separates many of the science areas from other parts of the university is practicals. And those practicals are often hands-on uh, in the laboratories uh, above us are where a lot of uh, the practicals take place and they are compulsory. So there still is, even with online material uh, where many students don't turn up to lectures, there's certainly aspects where students are still required to attend and I think they're very important aspects. Thanks, Dan. I will just yep. quickly say, if yep. you don't mind, so, um, uh, kind of related to you, if you don't go to lectures, especially in chemistry, you won't get to see great school science experiments. <laughs> They're better in person, trust me. Um, but I will say just quickly that um, it, I find more value coming into lectures because everybody says, yeah, I'll watch them online, don't worry, I'll do it later. You never do. <laughs> um, so it's best to be there and put yourself in that situation. Sit there and listen and go back online and recap everything. If you may have missed something during that, that, that time period, go back and rewatch the lecture. Don't use, unless you've got legitimate reason, don't go back um, and just use that as your only source of lecture content. Um, you get more out of it by being there. All right, thanks, Ella. All right, Hello. we have one more question. Yeah. Oh, it's not really a question, it's actually a bit of a statement. Um, can I just like to tell you that I'm actually a mature age student here. Um, I came back, uh, well, I came back to university a lot older. I'm a nurse by profession and then decided I, there was always something that I wanted to do. Not in sciences, but that's not the point. My son is here doing a science degree, finally got in. So um, I just want to say to you about the things of lectures. What I've learned is the most invaluable thing is that these professors, that I'm doing law and politics, put time in to your lectures and probably the way there's nothing like coming to a lecture and being lectured to by someone who is it motivates you to actually and spurs you to actually want to be going on and then if you if you don't go trying to actually catch up and sit down and going through some people some go through two three four hours of lectures is actually quite grueling and I don't think you get as much out of it so if I can say anything to any of these students I know you sort of think oh god another lecture I don't really have to go I can listen to it online but I do say to you from someone who's a mature age student um, who's only been at university here for a couple of years and I was in your position a couple of years ago I was overwhelmed and absolutely beside myself um, but the best thing that ever happened to me a lot of the lecturers the professors they're approachable but please do attend the lectures because I think you get a lot more out of it than trying to sit and then do a catch-up online it just doesn't happen Thank you. and at the risk of sounding like a broken record <laughs> um, you get le lecture theatres as big as this but um, your lecturers will remember your face so if you're one of those people that comes to lectures you can bet that when you go for references at the end of your degree, 
your lecturers and your demonstrators and your course coordinators are going to say, oh, I remember that kid, he was one of five people that showed up to my lectures for the whole three years. <laughs> and I co my course is fairly small um, and my lecturers know when I'm not there and I get emails about it. So <laughs> I definitely would recommend. And of course, if I didn't go to any lectures and I wouldn't have that kind of relationship with my academic staff and I wouldn't feel accountable. So I just, yeah. It's not just the fact of um, catching up with lectures and that you obviously do learn a lot better from being in lectures, but it's the relationships that you build from them as well, which are really overlooked. And if I could go back to my first year, I would probably attend quite a few more lectures. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have to draw the public Q&A session to a close now. I just want to say a, a few more things and then we're going to have an opportunity for you to talk, to come and talk to either the students, Ben here, um, any of the academics and also the uh, the advisors as well. So, I'm just, um, so this is really a, a repeat of what we've seen. This will be the last slide. We'll, we'll leave it up there. We are here to help the Faculty um, Sciences Hub, located in the Faculty of Sciences office, um, uh, is a very welcoming place, and it's filled with knowledgeable people who will bend over backwards. You've heard that uh, to help you out. You can contact us. Um, online, email, phone, or obviously uh, tonight as well. Something that hasn't been mentioned is scholarships. There are, there are scholarships available for students. If you're interested, um, please have a look at the, uh, the web page that's li that listed up there. And I remind you all that with your offers, if you don't have the offer you want right now, there is still plenty of opportunity to change that. So I've just left